Okay, uh, let me do one fun one. Um, so I guess I had a bunch of scenarios. I don't have time for all those scenarios. So let me just do one. Uh, what I'm going to claim is a fun one. Um, so um, so this is a diver thing. It's a, it's good for illustrating how you go about drawing the um, motion graphs for a very uh, clinical kind of physics problem type question. But it's not, uh, for most of us, it's not very relevant to what you might see every day. So I wanted to uh, illustrate a motion graph for what you might call stop and go traffic motion. That might be something that people see more regularly, like if you're driving in a congested traffic, um, the, you are able to move for a bit, then you have to stop, move for a bit, and then stop, move for a bit, and then stop. So, um, so I hope that description is clear enough to people. Um, so motion of a car in a congested traffic condition. Um, so let me do that. And uh, this is actually a bit of a, um, it, um, it's kind of opposite of the scenario I just drew. It's actually easier to draw with a position graph because I think uh, you can intuitively get what that motion should look like. So let's say time equals zero, you start up from position zero. So you start by moving and then you stop for a while and then you are able to go again. So you start moving again and then you stop for a while and then you are able to move again and then stop for a while, able to move again, stop for a while and so on. It looks like this. And, uh, I could have drawn it more fragile, but that's a kind of, um, and intuitively that uh, actually describes what a stop and go traffic looks like. And um, once you have that, then uh, what I want to do is uh, draw what, um, what the velocity and the acceleration curve looks like. There are some um, idealizations I'm making here. Um, so for these segments of motion here, I am going to assume that um, it's moving at a constant velocity. In real life, it might not be, but I'm just getting, I guess the average velocity and approximating that to be the instantaneous velocity for the entire time, even though it probably isn't. So let me get a few uh, time marks here. So I will get those into the velocity curve so that I plan out my time axis correctly and I don't run out of any space as I'm drawing them. So I have, I, it probably works out best if I number them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I shouldn't have done so many. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Nine, okay. And I'll probably need that for acceleration too, so let me do that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so, um, so the time period is broken up into basically nine or 10 um, periods, depending on how you count. And I'm just gonna sketch out what um, velocity and acceleration looks like at those different times. So from zero to one, I have constant positive velocity. So this is the velocity from zero to one. And then I have constant, but zero velocity. So that's one to two. And then I have constant velocity, which I guess I drew it faster than the first one for some reason. And then it's zero again. And then it's some positive constant value. And then it's zero, uh, five to six. And then six to seven, it's some positive value again. Seven to eight, it's zero again. And eight to nine, it's some positive value again. And then nine to it's zero again. It looks very disjointed. And um, it's part of the approximation that I'm making because I'm making this approximation that velocity is suddenly changing from one value to zero. And within that approximation, the velocity looks disjointed. If you want that to look more real, you could connect them and that looks more physically meaningful. Um, it looks like a more physically meaningful velocity curve, but it's a part of making that approximation 
of um, that there's a sudden changes. And you will see that approximation deleted through in the acceleration curve as I draw it now. So in the acceleration, when I draw the acceleration curve, it's almost better ignoring the position curve altogether because really the relationship that's most useful in giving you the intuition for acceleration is that it's a derivative of the velocity, meaning it's represented by slope of the velocity curve as a function of time. And sometimes that'll make us draw something that in, um, initially doesn't look intuitively correct, but well, that is what's actually mathematically correct. So from uh, zero to one, where the um, car is moving with a constant velocity, the acceleration is zero. And a lot of people might have difficulty with this initially because it's moving, why is acceleration zero? Well, the slope here is flat, velocity isn't changing. Uh, now, to get to this positive velocity, you probably had a non-zero acceleration before, but during this period, zero to one, acceleration is zero. And um, I guess maybe, uh, let me do this a whole, all the segments right now and uh, get it out of the way. You see that for all the segments between one to two, two to three, three to four, they are all flat. That's a part of the approximation I made. So acceleration during all these periods within this approximation is all zero between uh, these uh, transitions. So that's the part that, oops, it's meant to be zero. That's the part that's going to be very unintuitive, look very unintuitive to people who haven't thought about this this way before, that um, for vast majority of the time, acceleration is zero because you have constant velocity. Which it, whether it's at a constant non-zero value or whether it's at zero value, it's, it's constant. So acceleration is zero during those times. What um, gives you all this interesting motion in the end is what happens at a very small moment of time. So over this very small duration of time, you have a highly negative acceleration. So I have a spike in acceleration in the negative direction here. I have a spike in the acceleration in the positive direction here. So this acceleration curve uh, is very poorly behaved, which is why it's not a good uh, one for practicing how you draw the motion graphs. But um, basically these very steep slopes are what gives you these pulses in acceleration positive pulse, negative pulse, positive pulse, and negative pulse. Um, and, you know, it uh, looks very, um, it doesn't look uh, correct according to, maybe according to intuition of many people starting out, but this is what the math says it is. And part of your experience with uh, learning kinematics the way we cover actually in calculus and in physics is uh, developing this intuition that um, this very oddly looking graph, which um, you might not have expected is actually correct. And if you have experience driving, it kind of does match up with your driving experience, hopefully. Um, well, at least a very bad driver. Uh, when the car uh, comes to a stop, you weren't planning, so you suddenly come to a stop. Uh, sudden, um, sudden braking, and then when the car in front of you starts uh, get going, you suddenly accelerate, and then when it stops, you suddenly stop. I mean, it does represent a very bad driving, but uh, if we are trying to draw a very good driving, then these position curves wouldn't look like a straight line. They'll look like a parabola, where acceleration is more gentle. 